Castlevania is an immensely popular series, starring many incredible and divisive games. From its impressive beginnings on the NES, the series' evolution on PlayStation, and its haunting of the indie space as Metroidvanias thrive. But an often overlooked and forgotten side of the series was its beginnings on handheld, with Castlevania The Adventure and Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge for the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. The neglect these games receive can be seen in many ways. According to the website Backlogged, designed to allow people to log games they've played, Castlevania The Adventure has been played 11% as much as the original NES title. The Wikipedia article for the game doesn't even list the date the game was released in PAL regions, just sometime in 1991. And these games aren't held in good regard. Looking back to Backlogged, the original Castlevania holds a 3.4 out of 5. Castlevania 2 is a 2.8, and Castlevania The Adventure is at a low 1.6. Now, I don't believe in number ratings for games. I think it's usually just reductive, but they do show how people feel about them. So now that we've established this, I can get into why I disagree. I'll mainly be focusing on the first, but I'll get into my thoughts on two as well. So, for the first one, the more hated of the two, Let's go over some common criticisms of it from the different reviews I've read. Firstly, the game lacks any form of sub-weapons, so it was often called overly simplistic. Instead, your whip can be leveled while dropping a level upon taking damage. This, to me, just allows for much cleaner level design than the original, especially for a more cut-down console like the Game Boy. Not to say better, it's just a more minimalistic approach. The designers only have to account for the whip, so you're never in a section wishing you had the one sub-weapon that would break this part of the game. The issue usually remarked upon is that at the highest level of the whip, you gain more reach and can even shoot a small projectile from your whip. And in the later part of the game, it becomes a lot more important to hold onto it and to not take damage, which is often described as annoying or tedious. But to me, I don't see a difference whatsoever to that and taking damage in the original NES game. And there, the later levels were filled with instant kill falls. And when you take damage, you're locked into an animation that flings you back, and the enemies are often in points deliberately to knock you into those endless pits. So why does that game, that while generally is still called clunky, is still considered to have solid game design, but in this, but in the adventure, it's just annoying or tedious. Another thing usually mentioned is the slowdown. Castlevania The Adventure suffers from some performance problems, like a lot of games on Game Boy. Though it's important to remember it was also released the same year as the Game Boy's debut, so there wasn't too much console familiarity yet. But regardless of why, people usually complain about the issue. While I can certainly understand, I'd like to offer a counter-argument to say that it might actually help the experience, as the slowdown gives you a little bit more time to consider your actions, making split-second inputs a lot easier, while also making you feel really... while also making sure you really feel the consequences of stupid decisions. It's obviously not perfect, and I'm not saying it excuses the bad performance or justifies it, but I'm just saying that there's a little bit more nuance than people talk about. I mean, without the slowdown, they'd probably be complaining about the need to avoid damage that much more. Now to go over some smaller things I'd like to praise that aren't really complained about necessarily. First of all, I'm sure the footage you're seeing right now isn't that uh, impressive to you graphically. But remember, this was a Game Boy game in 1989. <laughs> At that time, this console was mainly handling tennis and Tetris. So the fact a full Castlevania game was on there so early is an achievement. Let alone one that didn't need to be all that dramatically simplified, both mechanically and visually. The Game Boy screen is tiny. You have to be smart about their inclusions, and Konami was, keeping visual clarity at all times. The Game Boy had very limited options when it came to sound, and yes, even here the sounds can be pretty grating, but that's more of a console issue than a game one, and even despite that, the game soundtrack's pretty catchy. So those are my general thoughts on the first game. Now as for the second, Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge, I have a little less to say about this one, as it's definitely liked more than the original, and uh, generally people just don't care about it as opposed to dislike it, but I still think it's great and still overlooked. It's significantly bigger than the first, taking nearly twice as long to beat. It has a Mega Man-esque level select screen, allowing you to play in whatever order you like, which is also quite neat. The game is a lot smoother, and even brings back sub-weapons. But uh, about that last thing, despite 
probably improving the game in the long run. I was a little disappointed to see the sub weapons back, because I feel like it kind of robs these games of their unique personality in the series as a whole. If it plays like a regular Castlevania, it just kind of blends in more, and when compared to the and when compared to Castlevania's on the NES, or God forbid, like, Bloodlines or Super Castlevania 4, by being s closer to the Castlevania formula, it loses its identity a little bit. Again, I don't think- it, they, it probably makes the game better it, on the whole, but I just feel like they probably could have iterated on that single whip design, so it's sad to see that it was abandoned before it had time to improve. Another notable thing between this game and the first is that each level ends with its own boss fight, each of them being pretty neat. There are also just a lot of smaller changes that really add up. The first coming to mind is being able to attack while on ropes, which was infuriatingly not an option in the first game. They've even put that into the design of one of the levels in this game. Speaking of which, the level design feels notably improved here, not in any direct ways I can point at, but rather just feels a lot more considered. The final boss at the end, however, is pretty infuriating. While the other bosses in this game kind of settled in my mind that I wasn't like the biggest fan of the final boss in Castlevania The Adventure, but god, this one's just ridiculous. It's filled with annoying bullet hell patterns that don't fit the arena or your movement options like at all. It, it leads to a lot of trial and error until you finally figure out the safe places, and you can only hit him very occasionally. It's just infuriating. I was playing with save states, so I abused them, uh, and that easily made it a lot better to handle, but just god. If I was playing this on original hardware and I got up to that fight, I would be miffed. But overall, in summary, I think both of these games are actually worth your time. Whether you're interested in the history of the franchise, or just want like a tough as nails hour or two long gaming experience. Both are in the Castlevania collection on everything, and even as save states like I mentioned before, which absolutely helped the experience. But then again, Konami is like literally evil, uh, so make your own decisions on where your money goes, but they're certainly recommended.